Well, one of the rules is don't, you want to you want to constrain the anomalous event to the minimal necessary domain. It's really, really important. You want to do that when you're arguing with your partner, which you'll do all the time. We have an argument. Well, I should never have married you. It's like, no, no, that's not the first response. That's a bad response. Or here's a really good one. You've always done that sort of thing. And you always will. It's like, oh, good. Great. It's like the only answer to that is to hit someone. Because like you're done, right? You're, you're like that. You've always been like that. There isn't a chance that you can be repaired and none of it is acceptable. It's like the person's going to fight with you right away because what else are they going to do? So what you want to do is you want to minimize. It, it isn't rationalization. You want to say, okay, this person did something that disrupted our joint map. Okay. What's the smallest possible thing they could do to put it back together? And you have to know. Well, um, we need to make a plan so you don't do it again. Or we need to have a discussion so that you know that it wasn't a good thing to do. But I'm not going to go after your whole character. I'm going to say, when I come home and you're watching TV, just come to the door and say hello. Not, don't you love me? Or something like that. It's like, no, no, you just have to walk to the door and like, give me a hug or something. And then that's good enough. And so then, the other person might be able to tolerate that much corrective information, maybe, if you're kind of nice about it, and you also understand that they're probably going to have something equally horrible to say about you in the next 15 minutes, because you're going to do something stupid. So, so you don't want to open the door so that every possible snake comes crawling through, because that's a pathway to depression. And you actually see that happening in depressed people, is that every small event produces a cascade through their entire value system and they end up saying, well, that's just another reason that I should jump off a bridge. And they really see it that way. It's really awful because they've got no defenses. It's like, well, I, I didn't do so well in this course. It's like, I'm, I'm going to get a bad mark in the, or in, in the exam. I'm going to get a bad mark in the course. That's going to screw up my ability to finish my degree. I'm never going to get into the field of my choice. It's just another piece of indication that I'm useless and that life isn't worthwhile. Bang, I'm going to jump off a bridge. And if you're really depressed, it's like each of those things hits you with the certainty of truth. It's really not good. And so you want to be careful. You want to be careful about walking down that pathway when you make a mistake. You think, okay, what's the narrowest framework of interpretation within which I can, I can understand this that will require minimal behavioral change to decrease the probability <clears throat> that it will happen again? It's, it's, it's mental hygiene, fundamentally. Yes? When you say that these frames are scalable, do yeah. there's multiple at the same time? Multiple? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. That is the next question. It's because they don't exist in isolation. So, and that's another thing, frequently, when, when, you, when you hear behavioral accounts of cognitive processes, they generally only focus on, as, as if it's an isolated thing. It's not. It ex it's scalable. It's scalable a bunch of ways. It's scalable temporally. Because what you do now is associated with what you'll do tomorrow and that with what you'll do next week and so forth. So it has to be scalable temporally. And it's also scalable socially. Right? So it has an effect on you, that has an effect on your family, that has an effect on the community, and so forth. And so you don't want to take... It's very difficult to think through the effect of your action on all those scaling levels simultaneously. But, but you have mechanisms that allow you to do that. And we'll, See, I think that the sense of, let's assume that you're not lying to yourself constantly, so your head isn't full of chaos and garbage, and you have reasonable relationships with people in the world. I think that, and this is leaping way ahead, I think that your sense of meaningful engagement with what you're doing is the psychophysiological marker that you're acting in a way that takes all of the stacked representations into account simultaneously. Because you're, 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 like, you're trying to figure out where you are. And you might think, well, that means where I am in this room. But look, this room is not a simple thing. Right? It's nested. It's, it's a subset of the university. That's a subset of society. It's a subset of your life. The room is a complicated thing. And you need to figure out where you should be in the room. And you can't do that sure, surely with perception, because all you see is me and some of the wall. Right? It's, you've got this little narrow, this little narrow portal. And so, you can't really rely on your perceptions to orient you. But you do orient yourself, and I think what you do is, you, it, it's engagement. It's like, does this seem meaningful and deep and engaging? Yes. Then, 
it's an indication that it's serving multiple masters simultaneously. So both, maybe both socially and also temporally. And so I think the sense of meaning is actually an instinct that orients people in time and space. It's not an epiphenomena. It's the most fundamental form of perception. And that's the only optimistic thought that I've ever been able to derive from psychology. Is that that actually could be true. It could be that the sense of meaning is an orienting reflex. And that would be wonderful if it was true, because it would make it real, you know, and it's one of the, you know, the, one of the devastating elements of nihilism is something like, well, who the hell cares what you're doing? What difference is it going to make in a million years? It's like your sense of meaning is just an illusion. You know, you're, you're a limited creature in a limited place and nothing you do really matters. It's like, that's a powerful argument, especially if you're an objective materialist and a reductionist. It's a killer argument, but it looks to me like it's wrong. It's actually wrong, because meaning looks to me like it's an actual phenomenon. It does say that you're, you're positioned properly between chaos and order, or something like that. It's real. So, well, so we'll see. We're going to develop that argument, because if, if it's real, you want to know that, because it gives you something to stand on. You know, maybe it's as real as pain, but it's not pain. It's something positive, and you need something positive that you can rely on. All right, so we're concentrating now on the unpredicted outcome or the undesired outcome because we said, well, that's like a portal, right? It, it's a portal through which doubt can pour and it's the thing that makes the irrelevant relevant again. And so that's why I use this little diagram. It's like, oh, oh, that's a, that's a fear face, roughly speaking. And I put all those stripes on it to indicate that it's not just fear, it's preparation for all sorts of different for all sorts of different perceptions and all sorts of different motivational states so imagine what happens when something knocks you back on your heels it's like not only does your body prepare but simultaneously with all that preparation all sorts of fantasies are generated like and what they are is all sorts of alternative worlds well why did this happen you go back into your past and you say well here's one route well here's another route here's another route here's another route here's another route like, I don't know what I did wrong, I don't know what anybody did wrong, but there's something back there that someone did wrong. And it can take people years to sort that out. And so those fantasies are all generated. And then the same thing happens with the future. It's like, well, what does this mean? Well, it could mean this, it could mean that. It could mean I'm getting divorced, it could mean I'm losing my house, it could mean I'll never talk to my kids again. It could mean that my career is going to collapse. Right? Or maybe I'll get, be able to get out of this stupid job that I've always hated and something better will happen. All at the same time. So that's... That's the response to anomaly. And the reason you respond that way is because you're no longer where you thought you were. Okay, so there's a simple way of looking at it. So what, what does an unpredicted or anomalous event mean? And I think this is, this is maybe the most important thing, the most important theme of the entire class might be what does an unpredicted or undesired outcome mean? The only thing that would be equally important is what should you do about it? But we'll start with what it means. And the answer is, well, you don't know what it means. It could mean anything. And that's a strange category, right? The, the category of anomalous events contains indefinite possibility. So what the hell do you do about that? Well, you prepare to do a variety of things. You can simplify it and say, well, it's half threat because something bad might happen, and it's half promise because something good might happen. Okay, so that's a good way of thinking about it. It's a portal. All of a sudden, instead of the thing being irrelevant, the thing is ambivalent. It contains some slice of all possible meanings, positive and negative. Okay, so you're trying to sort that out. That's partly why it's so stressful, too. And anger is a good response to that, because anger is partly, a, it's partly an advanced emotion, because it's got a positive emotion element, which is why anger can be righteous, you know. But it's got a negative element too. It's negative emotion and positive emotion at the same thing, same time. So it's like the ca canonical stress emotion. So, but it's very hard on people, it, anger. It's, it's very psychophysiologically demanding. So I started with that model and then I developed it into this model, which I like better. So you're moving from, you haven't seen this because it's not in the book. You're moving from point A to point B and you're using your actions, your known actions to get there. Okay, and what happens? You, f you run into an anomaly, and it's like a hole, it's a hole through the map, it's like a hole is burned in it or something like that, and the map's no longer relevant, 
And so what happens? While your positive emotion systems are activated, or disinhibited, that's a better way of thinking about it, and your negative emotion systems are disinhibited, and what might those be? Well, in positive emotion you have hope and interest and exhilaration and curiosity and confidence, and in the negative emotional space you have anxiety and fear and hurt and anger and guilt and shame and disappointment and disgust, like there's quite a stacking of emotions and you don't know which of those is going to be useful and relevant and so it all emerges at the same time 